I'm not Pastor Lane. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she's not here this this morning, but we have guest uh, pastor, Pastor Don Baker, that many of you know. And he's been here before. We welcome him, and we're, we're glad to have him with us here this morning. At this time, let's um, pause and prepare our hearts for worship as Hope plays the, the you know, prelude. Yeah, <laughs> forgot the word. Thank you.
This is the day that the Lord has made. We will be glad and rejoice in it. This is the year that the Lord has begun. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to those who seek him. We celebrate your faithfulness, O Lord. Okay, the opening hymn will be, O oh God, Our Help. It's found on page 117 in your hymn book, or the words will be on the screen. <coughs> and to others, mindful that our steps make an impact and our words carry power. May we walk gently. May we speak only after we have listened well. Creator of all life, help us enter the new year reverently, aware that you have endowed every creature and plant, every person and habitat with beauty and purpose. May we regard the world with tenderness, Lover of all souls, help us enter the new year joyfully, willing to laugh and dance and dream, remembering our many gifts with thanks and looking forward to blessings yet to come. In this new year, may the grace and peace of Christ bless us now and in the days ahead. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Peace of Christ be with you. Let's share the peace of Christ with one another. Okay, you may be seated. This morning, as we go to prayer, uh, I would ask if there's any joys or concerns that you'd like to bring up this morning. I'd like to mention that my uncle John passed away this uh, past week, and he's. Uh, uh, many prayers and for the family and the planning and the celebration of his life in the spring for the summer. Uh, and I also, uh, on a joyful note, I'm glad to have some of my grandkids here this morning. 
of J. Lee, Fallon, and Jacob. It's good to see you. <coughs> Welcome. Okay, anyone else? My brother Titus is in the hospital with COVID. He is improving, but uh, anxiety is one of his biggest concerns. Okay. Yes, Tina? Paige would like me to let you know that we lost our dog last month uh, uh, after 10 and a half years. Uh, yeah, that's a sad loss. But uh, Grandma was telling us about that too. So. <laughs> okay, is there any other? Connor tore his ACL at a basketball game two weeks ago, and he used to have surgery at the end of January to repair that. So just keep him in your ears. Yeah, last week we didn't know what the yeah, diagnosis was going to be, but uh, if you didn't hear Lorraine, Connor tore his ACL, he'll have surgery later on. So keep him in prayer. Anyone else? Yeah, my wife's nephew, uh, Andy Geyer, is in the hospital with COVID. It's been probably nine days now. And some days a little better, some days a little worse. Mm -hmm. Okay, so keep him in prayer. Others? Um, keep the family of uh, Steve Horton in your prayer. He passed this week with, with COVID. And uh, on a positive note, we were down in Richmond last week, and we had a very good time, and all went really well. Great travel. And, Good. Nice, nice for No, not the bridge. <laughs> Although I do like a white person. <laughs> All right. Any others? Yeah, it's a joy that Chris Anderson is home um, with Cooper and he, uh, he still has to be in um, isolation from everyone, but Chris is even home. Chris Anderson, which is uh, Norma and Sue's. Uh, nephew in law, I guess you would say. <laughs> Married to uh, their niece. So he's had leukemia and recently had a um, bone marrow transplant plant, but he's home now and uh, things are going fairly well for him at the moment. And also Peg. Peg yes. Keep Peg in prayer. I haven't had an update for a couple of days. Has anybody done I, an update? I just called Mike and Sue last night and She's still pretty weak. She is eating just a little bit and drinking, but um, she's still pretty weak. She did get up and walk from the kitchen to the kitchen and back, but <coughs> keep her in your prayers. <laughs> and we and um, Lynn still are sick with us. Okay. Rini, Lynn, and Peg all tested positive for COVID, and uh, they need our prayers as well. <coughs> Any others? Okay, uh, we, we need to pray for peace in our world, peace in our country, um, as uh, the new year begins, and uh, look forward to a better 2020. <coughs> okay, let's uh, pause for prayer. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we come again before you with thankful hearts mm -hmm. for all the blessings that you have given us. Lord, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace, your provision and the hope we have in you and our salvation. Lord, we th especially thank you for Jesus, the greatest gift of all. It was We celebrated his birth uh, this Christmas. And we just pray, Lord, that you would uh, make him real in our hearts and uh, that the Holy Spirit would fill the holes in our lives that that we may serve you and uh, have the hope of salvation in Jesus. Lord, we thank you for St. John's. We pray that you would be with us as a congregation. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to discern your will for our church as well as for our individual lives. Help us be uh, motivated and uh, encouraged to go out and serve you in the way that you would have us serve you. Lord, you have heard those that were lifted up here this morning. We know you know their situation better than we do. We pray, Lord, that you would be with them uh, both emotionally and physically and spiritually. 
that they would know that we love them, care about them, and, uh, and we pray for their um, healing. And Lord, there are those that are on our minds and hearts that have not been lifted up. We pray also for those as well. Lord, thank you for Pastor Don Baker, who is with us this morning. We pray that you would uh, touch his lips and be with him as he presents the message this morning. And that we would be attentive and listen for your word so that we can go out and uh, serve you better. Lord, we pray for our nation and our world, Father, that uh, your peace would come upon people, all people. And that we would all look to you for guidance and direction, not trust in our own wisdom, not seek our own um, uh, greeds, and that we would uh, come to you to serve you. Mm. Father, we again thank you for this day and the opportunity we have to come out. We pray that you would forgive us of the many times we fail you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, the hymn is Abide With Me, verses 1 and 3. And uh, it's number 700 in your hymn book. as your people this morning and we come before you in the name of Jesus in the name above every name in heaven and on earth our Lord and Savior Lord we acknowledge that you are our King you're worthy of all praise and honor glory may our worship today be in spirit and in truth and may it be a pleasing sacrifice to you Father we're thankful for your faithfulness we've sung about that and your mercy and your grace you're so good to us you are a good shepherd you're the great physician you're the source of every good gift thank you for the cross thank you for taking our place thank you for dying that we might have life and Lord I pray our response to that amazing grace would be lives of surrendered obedience and holiness may our hearts overflow with gratitude may we be men and women of compassion May we love as we've been loved. May we forgive as we've been forgiven. And Lord, we have, we've, we've asked today, but in the midst of so much turmoil in our world and so much need, we cling to the truth that you are a God of power and a God of love. And we pray that you would move mightily in this your world, bring about peace and justice, healing and wholeness. Lord, fill us today with your spirit, with the fruit of your spirit. 
We pray your blessing upon our brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world, all over this community, as we begin a new year. And Lord, we offer all of these prayers in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. I'll read the scripture here in a moment. It's great to be with you this morning. Thank you for having me. I've entitled this morning's message, New Directions for a New Year. I, I mentioned the sermon title to a good friend of mine who's traveled with me quite a bit, and he said, I hope you're not giving driving directions, uh, implying that there have been times, and I admit this, that I have done a rather poor job of understanding and following directions while driving. But as directionally challenged as I, I might be at times, I, I, I'm definitely better than a woman I read about in an article entitled, Trust Your Senses More Than Technology. Apparently this woman was on a walking tour in Park City, Utah, and she was using a Google map to guide her, and she followed the Google directions literally right onto a highway where she was struck by a car, and uh, now, then she followed up by suing Google for negligence in not warning her to not walk into traffic. <laughs> I'm sure that the folks at Google would love to counter sue, but I'm not sure there's a category for uh, maybe stupidity. I don't know what you would call that lack of extreme, extreme lack of common sense. Um, the directions that I, I'd like us to consider this morning have nothing to do with driving, but have everything to do with our lives in Christ. And I can't think of a better time to consider some new directions than the beginning of a new year. Pastor Andy Stanley of North Point Church in Atlanta, Georgia, made a statement a number of years ago that, that has really st stuck with me. And he said this, Direction, not intention, determines destination. Direction, not intention, determines destination. This principle is true in every area of life. If, if I leave here today and I want to go to Harrisburg, but I go south on 81 from a Chambersburg exit, it doesn't matter how good my intentions are, right? I'm not, I'm not going to get there. Because direction, not just intention, determines destination. And over my years in ministry, I've counseled with many people and had discussions with many people who had tremendous intentions about their lives in Christ, about their marriages, about parenting, about all kinds of things. But until they changed the direction they were headed, didn't matter how good the intentions were. This morning I'd like us to consider some new directions that I believe Jesus is calling us to, inviting us to, challenging us to, as we enter 2022. And if you have your Bibles and you want to read along, I'm reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, the first 11 verses. So this is the word of the Lord from the Gospel of Luke. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, or the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. And he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, to Simon Peter, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to him, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, 
and follow Jesus. Pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and may the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In Luke chapter 5, we are early in the public ministry of Jesus, but he's already usually popular. He's standing by the Sea of Galilee. He's, it, it, there's a crowd pressing in on him. He's teaching them the Word of God. And as the people move in close to him, we're told that Jesus gets into a boat that's along the shoreline that belonged to a man by the name of Simon Peter. He asked Peter to put out a little bit from the shore so he could teach the crowd. And Peter, who spent the whole night fishing, who's in the process of cleaning his nets, he complies with this request. Now, this is a side road to my sermon, but it's an important side road. I think it's really significant to note that this is no chance encounter between Jesus and Peter. This is, this is an intentional move of Jesus to pursue Peter. We know that he's already met Peter from John chapter 1. And I believe that Jesus has, has a great desire to bring Peter onto the team. So what does he do? He goes to where Peter is. He enters into Peter's world. He goes where fishermen have spent the night fishing. They've caught nothing. I'm sure they're, they're tired. Their language is probably a little salty. And he accepts them as they are. And he begins to initiate a relationship. The way he often does. By asking for help. He asks the woman at the well for a drink. He asks Zacchaeus, can I have lunch at your house? Here, he asks Peter, can I borrow one of your boats? He does that for the purpose of of building a relationship with, with Peter to bring him onto the team. Now, it's a side road. But if, here's a side road question. Where are you, where am I, intentionally pursuing people for the sake of the gospel? Who has God laid on my heart, who, who's laid on your heart, who you believe God wants on the team, wants in the family of God? This text reminds us that Christ-like ministry is go be with people, not expect them to come to us, right? Go be with them, enter their world. Jesus says in John 20, 21, as the Father sent me, so I send you. So for all of us, I think that means that we are seriously thinking about who are the people that God's laid on my heart that he wants me to pursue and to begin to build a relationship with for the sake of the gospel. It could mean moving to another country for some people for missions. It could mean moving across the street just to know our neighbors. If you're in school, it could mean sitting at the lunch table with somebody who no one else sits with. There's all kinds of ways that we can enter into, initiate this idea, but I believe God's calling us to this. The late Stan Mooneyham of World Vision, one of the former presidents of World Vision, once said this. He said, the other day when I was reading about a certain church, I came across the fact that it seats 900. That's a common way of describing size. But I wondered, is seating power the way a church should be measured? Wouldn't sending power be more relevant? I'd like to know if the church sends 900, or even 90, or even 9. Perhaps we've gotten into the habit of lump lumping church going with spectator sports, where it's the coming and not the going that's important. But it seems to me that the church might better be trying to empty its seats. The church is or ought to be a sending agency. A recruiting office doesn't talk about the number of recruits it can hold, but the number it's sent. Come to think of it, Mooneyham says, I've never seen a very big or a very plush recruiting office. They don't have to be because the action is somewhere else. That's a great reminder of God's call to send. We're, we're being sent. Who's God sending you to? Who's the Lord sending me to? For the sake of the gospel. So Jesus pursues Peter here. Jesus finishes his teaching. And Peter begins to row back towards shore. And Jesus says, Peter, turn your boat around and put it out into deep water. And I want this to be the first new direction that I believe the Lord's calling us to in 2022. Turn from shallow to the deep. It's a great metaphor for our lives. Let's allow that to be a metaphor of what Jesus is calling us to. What a life-changing call and invitation. What an important direction to move from shallow to deep. Richard Foster, in his book, 
the celebration of discipline, made this comment. He said, superficiality is the curse of our age. The doctrine of instant satisfaction, being satisfied, I don't know why I have a hard time with satisfaction. I can't say that word. <laughs> Anyways, is a primary spiritual problem. The desperate need today is not for a greater number of intelligent people or gifted people, but for deep people. It's a great call. We live in an age of tremendous shallowness, don't we? And I think social media has helped really create this. We strive in American culture after outward beauty, after quick fixes. We define people often by what they've acquired or, or a particular skill that's been given to them. We're comfortable with easy answers and catchy slogans. We demand comfort, and we're proud of our impatience, and we're quick to stereotype. We're poor listeners. I love the, the prayer that we'd be better listeners this year. And this cultural addiction to, to superficiality can dangerously bleed into our spiritual lives. But God calls us to be people who are deep. The scripture says deep calls to deep. The author of Hebrews speaks to this movement from shallow to deep in Hebrews chapter 5 when it says this, Though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word. You should be eating meat, not drinking milk. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. And then the author says this, Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward into maturity. That's a call to move from shallow to deep. Paul says the same thing in Philippians. He says, not that I've already attained all this, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what's behind, straining toward what's ahead, I press on. I press on. I move from shallow to deep. What an important call for you and I. What could that look like in your life and in my life? A few years ago, I received a phone call from a man in our church, and he said this, I need your help. I've been in the church all my life, got a great family, got a great job, I'm greatly blessed. And he said this, but I've been going through the motions spiritually for a long time, and I don't want to do that anymore. And that began a journey that we had where he began to move from shallow to deep in his walk with Christ, and it was transformational in his life. I don't know what that might look like for you or for me this year. It might mean being much more intentional about our prayer life, about our scripture reading, about our study of the Word of God. It might mean beginning to see a therapist to deal with some issues in my life that I haven't dealt with yet, right? Or learning some practices or beginning to see a spiritual director who can help me take some next steps in my walk with Christ. Or read some books that would really help me go deeper, that would challenge me. I don't know what it means, but I do believe that God constantly is calling us, put your boat out into deep water. Move from the shallow to the deep. That's the first direction. Now I imagine Peter saying, Lord, you're a great teacher. In fact, you're an amazing teacher, but you're not a fisherman. You're telling me to move out here and put my nets down into a place that we've already fished all night. Fishermen fished at night. And we fished that spot. And, and we caught nothing. But then Peter says these amazing words. I don't know if you caught this. He said this. But because you say so, I will. Because you say so, I will. And let this be our second new direction that we're being called to. To turn from what I think is the right thing to do to what you say is the right thing to do. To turn from my will to thy will. So because you say so, Jesus, I will forgive, even though I don't feel like forgiving. And because you say so, Jesus, I will serve, even when I'm tired. And because you say so, Jesus, I will love, even when it's hard to love. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, made this comment. He says, only the one who believes is obedient, and only the one who is obedient believes. For faith is only real when there's obedience, never without it. 
And faith only becomes faith in the act of obedience. That's a powerful statement. Faith only becomes faith in the act of obedience. A few years ago, I received a letter from a good friend of mine who, at that time, was homeless, living on the streets in Chambersburg. Financially poor, but a spiritually rich man. And he, he, he shared in this letter, I think, a picture of this challenge, of this struggle between obedience and faith. Uh, and I, I'd like to share it with you. He gave me permission to share this. Here's what he wrote. He says, Dear Don, Friday afternoon I must have asked a half dozen people to buy an electronic game I had for a dollar, but I still have it. Walking up Main Street with a little change in my pocket, I found a wallet with over $100 in it. I wish I could tell you I ran to the phone booth to contact the woman who owned it, but I didn't. Instead, I was thrown into a huge dilemma. Should I call her? Should I keep it? I must have struggled for well over an hour with all kinds of thoughts going through my head. What if that woman had to go through the entire weekend broke? What if a fight broke out in her household because she lost all the money? What if she were home crying while I was walking around wondering what to do? Finally, he writes, Jesus won. Got hold of her, and about 10 minutes later, we were sitting together, and I was sharing the struggle I went through. And I, I told her, I'm not such a great person, but Jesus is. That's a profound picture of the struggle between our faith in Christ leading us to obedience, to do the right thing. To, from my will to thy will. C.S. Lewis once made the comment that in the end, really, this is the only choice we have. We say to God, thy will be done. Or God says to us, okay, have it your way. I pray that we would make the decision to say, God, thy will. Show me what that means in the new year. How can I move from this idea of my will to thy will more and more? So they do. They, they obey and they experience this incredible catch, right? The boats are sinking. And this astounding catch has a unique impact on Peter. You know, we know that fishing was a respectable profession in this time. And this is, a, this is the catch of a lifetime. This is a catch that can turn this business around, right? I mean, it's a lucrative catch, financially, professionally. But notice the new direction that Peter takes in verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees, and he said, Go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. Peter turns from the status of this great catch and the pride that could come with this to a posture of humility. His nets are tearing, his boat is overflowing, and Peter turns from standing to kneeling. From standing to kneeling. He bows, he falls to a knee, his knees in a pile of fish, and in words full of respect and humility, he begs Jesus to depart. And I think, I believe, this is the beginning of real transformation in Peter's life. This is the beginning of true conversion. Because mission always begins, in a sense, on our knees. Mission begins with a deep recognition of God's abundant mercy and my emptiness. That I, I don't bring much to this. <laughs> I just bring myself. But you bring your mercy, you bring your grace, you bring your provision. The blessings of God in our lives of which there are so many, aren't there? I mean, you really think about your life. The blessings of God should drive us to our knees in gratitude and in humility. God fills the boat over and over in our lives. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, the Apostle Paul asks this very telling question. He says, what do you have that you did not receive? And I've thought about that question a lot. What do I have in my life that I didn't receive as a gift from God, as a challenge from God? Nothing. I can't think of anything. So in light of that, I want to encourage you and challenge myself, as many of us as are physically able, during this new year, to take a few moments every day to go from standing to kneeling. Get on your knees. Maybe just roll out of bed right onto the floor, just for a moment, on your knees, in humility and in gratitude for the grace of God. Our
bodily posture before God has a profound impact on our spiritual lives. We raise our hands, we bow our heads, we get on our knees. A great discipline to consider in the new year. Peter says in 1 Peter in his letter, humble yourselves before the Lord. We're told in Philippians that one day every knee will bow before the Lord. Let's do it willingly now. Spend some time each day on your knees before the Lord. A few moments in gratitude, in thankfulness, in humility. It's a great movement. And if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, there's no better day than, than the beginning of a new year to say, Lord, I'm yours. I want to be all in for you. Thank you for your mercy. Now, as meaningful as Peter's actions are in verse 8, going from standing to kneeling, his words, I believe, reveal a fundamental error in his theology. Because Peter says what? Leave me, Lord. Go away from me because I'm sinful. Peter thinks that because he's a sinful man and he acknowledges that, that disqualifies him from being in the presence of the Lord and from serving Him. When just the opposite is true, when we acknowledge our need, when we acknowledge our sinfulness, that's a precondition for service in the kingdom. In one sense, Peter's prayer here is a terrible prayer. Because if Jesus answers that prayer, then Peter's all alone. He's hopeless. A better prayer is this. Lord, I'm a simple man. Come near. I need you. I need you. And Jesus responds to this prayer by saying this to Peter. Don't be afraid. I love that. Don't be afraid. I'd like to suggest this as another direction to take as we begin 2022. Turn from fear to trust. Now that sounds simplistic. But I was thinking about this this week. I would dare say that fear has done as much damage to the life of discipleship as anything else. Fear of the unknown. Fear of what people will think. Fear of the cost. Fear of failure. I think fear keeps so many from serving, from giving, from loving. So Jesus says, don't be afraid. Trust me, Peter. Trust me. I'm going to infuse your life with my love. I'm going to use you as part of my kingdom purposes to have profound impact for me. And we see that fulfillment of that promise in Peter's life, don't we? Read the book of Acts. Read it in the first chapter, the very first sermon preached in Acts is by Peter, Simon Peter. And thousands of people respond to the gospel. Just as we see the fulfillment of this promise in our lives, as we turn from fear to trust. I was thinking about all the ways I've seen this in my life. One of the first I remember is when I was a, a Christian for about a year. I was young. I was 22. And I was a volunteer with the ministry Young Life, reaching out to high school kids. Uh, and I was, you know, just finishing college. And about a year after my training, the director, Bob Snyder, said, I want you to give the talk at the club meeting this week. And so I can remember. It was of February 1980. I'm sitting in, in a car outside of a house on 6th Street in Chambersburg where there's going to be 50 high school kids, non-Christian high school kids, in this basement. And I'm supposed to give the talk about Jesus calming the storm. And I'm sitting in the car. I, I'm, I'm a mess. I, I'm, I'm, I'm questioning myself. I'm questioning my ability to do this. I'm questioning why God would want that. I mean, I, I, I thought I was going to get sick. I thought about just driving away. I, mean, I was. And here's what God taught me. And began to teach me then and has taught me many times since. As I trusted Him. He's bigger than our fears. He's bigger than our fears. He can work through our fears as we trust Him. And He can use us for His kingdom purposes. So Peter makes a directional change. He turns from fear to trust. He turns from a life of fishing. A life that he knows. A life he's comfortable with a life he's successful at, he turns and he leaves. And listen to verse 11, and let this be our final new direction for a new year. Verse 11 says this, So they pulled their boats on shore, left everything, and followed Jesus. Amazing statement. They pulled their boats on shore, they left everything, and they followed Jesus. 
Maybe you're familiar with the name Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf. I've been deeply moved in learning about him over the years. He was born, he was a German born in 1700. He founded a community of Christians that was called the Lord's Watch, which became later known as the Moravians. And that should mean a lot to us as to those who've grown up in the Methodist context. I grew up in a Methodist church because John Wesley, uh, in his conversion, was deeply impacted by the Moravians. He was on a boat coming from America back to England, and the boat had a terrible storm and almost sunk, and Wesley was scared to death because he hadn't given his life to Christ. And the Moravians on the boat were just at peace. And it wasn't long after they landed that John Wesley writes in his journal about having his heart strangely warmed and coming to acknowledgement of Christ and beginning this movement that we call the Methodists. In 1727, this community of the Moravians started an around-the-clock prayer watch that lasted unbroken for 100 years. Members of that church would commit one hour out of every 24 hours to pray. For 100 years, they prayed for missions and for the gospel to go around the world. And within 65 years, this little community of about 300 people had sent, listen, 300 missionaries all over the world. Unbelievable. Zinzendorf shares that it all began after he finished college, what we, they call university. He took a trip through Europe, and he was visiting high cultural spots, and something very unexpected happened. He was a follower of the Lord at this point. He was in an art museum in Dusseldorf, and he saw this painting. It was, it's entitled, Behold the Man. You can look it up. It's a portrait of Christ with a crown of thorns and the blood running down his face. And beneath the portrait are these words. I have done this for you. What have you done for me? And Zinzendorf says, all of his life he points back to this encounter as what started this whole movement. Because he says, as I stood there looking at this and, and reading those words... I realized this. I have loved him for a long time, but I've never actually done anything for him. And he says, from that point on, I will do whatever he calls me to do. He went from everything to one thing, to following the Lord. From everything to one thing, just as Peter does here. And of all the qualities that mark Simon Peter's life, this is by far the most significant. He followed Jesus. He followed. He failed, but he followed Jesus. And my prayer for myself and my prayer for you is that this will be the primary characteristic marking our lives as we move into the new year. That we refer to ourselves as followers of Jesus above and beyond being Christians or members of a church or America, whatever. But we're followers of Jesus close behind him. May all of these new directions lead to that one destination, close behind our Lord, our Savior, our teacher, our friend, King Jesus. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, help us, help me, help each of us to move from shallow to deep. Show us what that means in our lives. Lord God, may our prayer this year be not my will, but thy will. And Lord, I, I believe that starts in little things, in little areas. But would you, would you reveal that to us? Lord, help us to live this year in a posture of humility, to spend some time on our knees in gratitude. And God, may you release us from the fears that keep us from really moving forward in and, and show us more and more what it means to trust, to hold on to you. And God, I pray that what would mark our lives this year is we've moved from everything to one thing, to follow you. I pray that for myself and I pray that for my brothers and sisters here. We pray all of this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Closing him, 
If you have uh, offering envelopes, uh, the new ones for 2022 are out in the vestibule on the stand out there. If you don't have envelopes or haven't had in the past and you'd like to have some, see Norma and she can get you a uh, pack of envelopes. Are there any other announcements that should be made? Okay, if not, we appreciate your message, Pastor Don. And the closing hymn is Hymn of Promise, 707 in your uh, benediction. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's go forth to love and serve the Lord. Thank <laughs> you.